that I would start uh, for today um, to uh, give thanks to the people that uh, have uh, enabled me to give today's talk. So in particular, I want to acknowledge um, all of the technical staff that we have downstairs in the facility that helps us with the data acquisition. I want to, of course, uh, thank the uh, uh, funding sources, my laboratory, and, but in particular, these individuals, um, uh, two of which have already moved on and are doing postdoc um, at Princeton and Rochester University, respectively, because they collected the data, some of which that I will show today. Um, I'd also like to uh, really thank um, now to Kia, who's a long-term collaborator of mine, a friendship that I think started when I was still a graduate student. And as you will see, he was absolutely instrumental to uh, what I will be talking about today. So nothing uh, would have been possible without now. And uh, a lot of the things that I will talk about, you should in your mind think about this is now because uh, I'm just in a way stealing his ideas. So what happened is that I was finally able to gain some time to actually just uh, sit back and think um, this uh, summer. Uh, many things have been accomplished in the lab, so that allowed me to uh, take a bigger picture. And as it so often happens, when you do that, you end up with very little. Um, this right here is actually quite relevant because it is uh, a newspaper clip about uh, some of the discoveries that I will talk about today, which is that uh, we could maybe think about something as negative information. And so the journalist, I think, put it quite succinctly. So, to get started, I think that all of us agree that when it comes to understanding the brain, there's still a whole lot of work to do. There's a whole lot of, uh, for us to figure out. And that uh, it takes a multidimensional approach to find out how uh, uh, the brain functions, how perception works, how behavior comes about. And I know that many of us work on different parts of this multidimensional space. And due to so many people working on this, uh, there's been tremendous progress in uh, covering the space within each of these spaces. So I'm just showing here, for example, time versus uh, spatial resolution when it comes to anatomy or when it comes to function. You can see that thanks to the ingenuity of uh, many of our uh, ingenious colleagues, we're uh, approaching the point where we're actually covering all of these different uh, um, uh, dimensions within each of these domains. And the speed of that um, improvement, the technical improvement, is uh, staggering. So you might have heard of Moore's Law, which is uh, how computers have improved over the last couple of decades. And so what you see right here is the number of simultaneously recorded neurons in different studies. And I want you to know that this is a logarithmic scale. So we're actually on, on this exponential increase of gaining data over time. So why are we doing that? Why are we pushing for that? Well. Intuitively, I think all of us think of the brain as something like that. It is a uh, complicated, but complex structure uh, with various parts that interact with each other. And uh, what we're hoping to do is by gaining data from all these varying parts, they were able to somehow finally figure out what these interactions are. And so words that people, I think, in an attempt to verbalize this intuition that we all share, often use are information flow or causal interactions. And I'm, I'm just showing here uh, something from a random paper uh, visualizing that, that we're thinking of different parts of the brain. This could be uh, areas, this could be neurons, this could be, uh, you name it, what kind of structure, and how it impacts or influences via neural activity another part of the brain. The problem with that is that despite the fact that these techniques have become multidimensional and we're starting to understand and appreciate the brain uh, in this ways of looking at several parts of the brain simultaneously, the mathematics and the analysis that we have is still kind of stuck, I would argue, in a pairwise way. So uh, this right here is a, uh, a, a very famous approach, of course, of analyzing neural data. This one would be another one. And what you notice is that we typically, we take spike series or we take local feed potentials or other time series, and then we look at the interaction. Uh, at the lowest level, what we do is we compute correlation coefficients, or we use slightly advanced versions of that where we uh, introduce a time lag and then try to infer causality. But importantly, all of these techniques are still based on pairwise comparisons. And that seems to be a limitation, not on the data collection side, but on the data analysis side, that even though we're measuring five, six, seven, you name it how many parts of the brain simultaneously, we're not able to analyze them this way. We're then breaking it down into pairs and analyze each of these pairs. Now, um, if you followed the field over the last one or two years, which has been a little bit troubling given the situation, but uh, there's been a lot of, I want to call it underground activity via blogs, via YouTube, and so on, then you know that there's a huge push right now to try to get out of this dilemma. And I'm just mentioning um, one of uh, these works right here, which is uh, basically what it boils down to, to use more complicated mathematics, to use machine learning techniques, uh, artificial intelligence techniques, and to appreciate that we do have multidimensional data, many neurons recorded at the same time, 
try to come up with a mathematical model that extracts a maximum out, uh, information out of that. And then eventually, for many, the goal is to predict behavior, which is measured at the same time. And the number of techniques that are doing that is mushrooming at the moment. Uh, so there's uh, an attempt of multidimensional, multi, multidimensionality reduction within the field of multi multidimensionality reduction, where um, there's competitions to see which of these techniques works better than the other one. And so I'm very appreciative of this approach. But uh, one thing that concerns me is this that we're coming up with a, uh, an abstract model that uh, is unlikely to be exactly what the brain is doing. So uh, we're here at the grain line of neuroscience and engineering, where we're trying to optimize a readout of the brain, uh, maybe perhaps rather than trying to understand what the brain is actually doing. So what I want to advocate today is an alternative approach, and it's from an unlikely candidate that I stumbled over the summer. So um, I feel that I'm on the defensive here, so I would try to to uh, yeah, defend uh, why this approach might be interesting to what we do. So this right here is a graph that I took from a book um, that uh, was interested in heavy and learning. And so most of us know what heavy and learning is, neurons that fire together, they wire together. And so this diagram stuck out to me because yes, you have two presynaptic neurons and one postsynaptic neuron, and then you see the weight of the synapses that you can alter to change the learning rule. Well, with what I just told you, the issue that I see is that even if we measure something as simple as three neurons, two that give input onto a postsynaptic neuron, then in the analysis, we break that down into pairwise comparisons. And what we're losing this way might be something as a combined effect of these neurons on this neuron. So we can find out the individual effects of each of these neurons, but any synergistic effect is lacking. Moreover, I believe that if we're focusing on neural activity, and by the way, this took me a long time to appreciate, that we're missing something out that the brain might be doing. Uh, this I took from a talk on quantum, computer, quantum com computing and quantum physics, where I think a lot of uh, progress has been made on understanding the nature of information. And I'm slightly altering this graph. So let's assume that we have three neurons here and then three neurons there, and then they're connected with three axons, X and B, uh, A and C. Well, what's logical to us is that we can't have information cross because there's only three individual axons. So if the green and the red information collides here and it is transduced via this axon, they will get merged together and you only get one new type of information. So that is true for neural activity. As long as we're just measure, measuring spikes and activation, this is what we're dealing with. Well, the interesting thing is that neurons, they don't behave just as simple switches. Neurons, they can be approximated in many cases as a logic gate. So I'm just throwing one of these logic gates out here, which is an XOR gate. So in this case, this neuron would only fire if one or the other inputs is active, but if both inputs give you the same result, they're both inactive or they're both active, this neuron doesn't fire. If we assume these neurons that I'm showing you right here to be XOR gates, note what happens. Now we can actually have information cross because this neuron, if it gets this activation and activation from here, it can infer what the activation is over here. So what I'm getting is, is that the flow of information is actually different than the flow of activity thanks to the fact that the brain has logic gates built in. So we probably should try to get to the level of information if we want to understand what the brain is doing. And so uh, I uh, promised Susanna uh, to show this today, which is that uh, a recent PNAS paper came out and it makes an even bigger claim that um, by looking at communication and uh, doing the kind of physics uh, equations that Susanna is doing and trying to understand what limits brain function on a physics perspective, that communication seems to be actually uh, what the brain spends more energy on than computation, which is maybe the other way around than we do it today in neuroscience. So what's the way out? So let's go back to this diagram of HEP. The solution that I stumbled upon, uh, as I said, was from an unlikely source. And so I put it up here, which is a paper that recently appeared in Science. This paper, as a lot of you might know, is uh, uh, describing a big investment of a private foundation, the Templeton World Foundation, into the neuroscience of consciousness. And the particular idea that has gained uh, traction is that uh, it seemed that we have made a lot of progress on the theoretical side. So there's a lot of theories of how the brain might generate consciousness, but Maybe we have failed a little bit on doing our homework in terms of falsifiability and take these uh, theories, hold uh, their feet to the fire and see which one works. And just to clear up any potential confusions, when I talk about consciousness in this talk, what I will talk about is pretty much equivalent to what we call subjective perceptual experience. It's the fact that we perceive the fact that the world is something to us. It is what goes away when you fall into deep sleep, when you anesthetize deeply or when you fall into coma and it comes back uh, during dream sleep or every morning that you wake up. That is what I call consciousness, because I know uh, there's all kinds of definitions out there. So it's the very fact that you experience something. And so for the longest time, as people know, this has been seen outside of the realm of science. So for some of you, it might come as a surprise that there are theories that are trying to deal with that. The funding in this case is taking two of these theories and pitting them together in what's called an adversarial collaboration. Today, I will just focus one of these theories, and uh, I hope that you will see in a moment why. 
This theory is called integrated information theory. Now, it will take me a whole talk to walk you through what integrated information theory is. So I'm just trying to give you what it, uh, a feeling for what it is in a nutshell. So again, let's think that these would be interconnected neurons. What integrated information theory does is it disconnects some of these connections that might exist between these neurons or between the system under study within the brain. And then it is comparing the change that these connections did. If you see that there's any change in the system because you disconnected some of these connections, then you assume that these connections are important, that they're irreducible. You can't do without these connections to keep the system as function. That's the, that's the idea in a nutshell. And basically, uh, what integrated information theory predicts is that the number of these uh, uh, irreducible uh, connections, they... Uh, allow you to quantify the state of consciousness that somebody in. And more importantly, um, with what I will get to today, they will eventually, that's the idea, allow you to find out what the actual experience is that somebody has with mathematical equations. Why am I emphasizing mathematical equations? So this is uh, uh, a schematic um, that just sprung up of, of uh, my poor brain, but I'm trying to rank uh, theories in science by their rigor. And I think most of us would agree that at the very minimum, a theory that we would even consider as scientists should be logically coherent, logically consistent. Um, now, if you read about the literature of what uh, philosophers think, or uh, scientists that are concerned about these problems think that uh, theory in science, a good theory should be, the next step that you might hear about is falsifiability, and I already used this term. It means that you can show that a theory is incorrect. And that goes back to Karl Popper, who was concerned about the philosophical direction in his time, that try to find proof, that try to show the reason that science is so successful is because we're getting a truth. And he was, he was alarmed by the fact that that seemed to be a no-go, that seemed to be a dead end. And so what he proposed is that science can never prove anything, but science can show that things are wrong. And so what science does is it rules out wrong uh, hypotheses, and thereby we're approaching over time closer and closer to truth. So the important thing here is that science never knows the truth, but we're gradually approaching it. So uh, Pete Hine called it, we err and err and err, but less and less and less. So for some people, I put this around here, there would be a Popperian boundary that they don't accept theories that are logically consistent, but they're not falsifiable. And in physics, you have a lot of debates whether string theory or other of these theories that are logically consistent are falsifiable or not. Now, on top of that, I would say that sometimes goes hand in hand that a theory should make predictions. So that allows you to falsify a theory. And I'm making a distinction between qual qualitative predictions and quantitative predictions, because I think it is superior if you come up with quantitative predictions. In order to come up with quantitative predictions, usually you need to have some mathematical formalism associated with your theory. And as you can imagine, it is much easier to falsify something that gives you a number that you can look for in an experiment and don't find than something that might have a way out of just changing the theory under, underneath your seat. And what I'm emphasizing is that information, integrated information theory is right here. It's a mathematically formalized theory that makes quantitative predictions that we can test, and I'm excited about that. Just to show you about the mathematical formalism, this is a simplified version of integrated information theory. It's also the previous version, 3.0, uh, and what I'm going to talk about is 4.0. Now, you might have the same instinct that I do when you see sites like that. This is what one of my mentors at some point said, that be wary if people just dazzle you with math, especially if they don't give you the time to work, to work through this math. So I will take this time today to work you through it and hopefully make you excited about it. Because, no, it's not just math. This right here, and I mentioned now before, is using this math in the form of computational algorithms and looking at neural data. What now in this lab did at this point, they inserted a multi-electrode in the mushroom body of a fruit fly, and then they anesthetized the fruit fly or kept it uh, alert. And as I just said, there's quantitative predictions of integrated information theory, what a conscious state, assuming that a fly can be conscious, should do and what it shouldn't do. And they ran uh, their data through this math, and that's exactly what they found. So what I'm advocating for today is that this crucial step that they took, that they uh, took the mathematical formalism and this theory and they apply it to neural data, might be interesting to all of you guys, even if you're not at all interested in the question of consciousness. Why is that? Well, as I said, this is the example uh, that I want to go through with the three interconnected neurons, and I want to measure the combined effect of them. Well, as you're calculating integrated information theory, which ultimately uh, uh, spits out a scalar that is called phi, you, I think, or I propose, uh, are solving this problem. So this is directly taken from a presentation that introduces how integrated information theory works. And you see that we have a similar kind of situation where you have two neurons, so in this case two buttons, and they're giving input onto a third. Now the idea that is introduced in integrated information theory is basically to apply something that we call Markovian chains. So what you're doing is you're finding out the state of C. Let's say this neuron is either active, here in yellow, or it's inactive, here in white. And you're looking at the state of the inputs. In this case, both of them are inactive. And you're finding out what is the probability, if I measure the data, to find out that it deletes uh, in one or the other state? So in this case, if A and B are inactive, as they are right now, there's a 90% probability that C will also be inactive. Does that make sense, everybody? So you can see how, if you think of your own data, that this might be pretty easy to derive. 
And then you can go on and you can look at all the possible combinations of states. In this case, A is active, B is active, both are active. And then you measure the frequency with which um, uh, the, the third state is arrived. And then in a way you conflate frequency with probability, which is something that all of us feel comfortable with as well. Now you can see how this directly leads to that and might be a way out because now I don't only do the pairwise comparison, how A and B influence C, but I also look at their combined effect and you can see that there's a difference. And of course you don't just have to do it for three neurons, so this would be a simple case of four neurons. And you can see that of course the complexity uh, with which you derive goes up exponentially. So there's a lot of details here that this is an actual model of different logic gates and you can see that the probabilities here are deterministic in their zero or one, but as I said, you can do this for your data. I will show this in a moment for data from my lab and uh, come up with actual probabilities. So why is this interesting? This right here in uh, Markovian uh, statistics we would call a transition probability matrix or a short TPM because you're looking at the uh, probability of a transition from this state to that state. So I made one tiny leap here that I snuck in for you guys, which is that we're not looking at A, B, C, on D anymore. We're looking at the whole system. So A, B, C, and D, and then we're taking a leap of time. And then a moment later, we look at A, B, C, and D again and see what happened. So what you see right here might be the present, and this right here is the future. And then this right here, these values give you the transition probability to go from one state to the other state. And of course, uh, I put this down here. One of the nice properties of having a two-dimensional matrix is that that is the very heart of most of what we do nowadays about big data, machine learning, all of these techniques that people get excited about in the end are just linear algebra and matrices. Okay, so what does that mean for your data? So you might have done it in your head already. There's one problem, which is that as you're introducing more and more elements to this transition probability matrix, it explodes in size. So the data that I will show you today will be either three simultaneously recorded neural sites or six simultaneously uh, recorded sites. And I did the math. What would it be like for what I told you guys today that we're moving towards measuring so many neurons at the same time and it's actually kind of depressing. So we're at this point here already that we can record 24 or 32 channels at a time and so we would be in the quintillions at that point in terms of the matrix size. Uh, with the Neuropixel probe, which most of us are moving to quite rapidly, uh, you get up to something that is twice on the order of what a Google is like, so huge numbers. I'm not discouraged by that and we can talk about quantum computing and other ways that I think we're gonna be getting out of this dilemma, but what I'm advocating is to start simple and to just start applying these techniques for our data with lower dimensions. So as I said, I'm gonna stick to six dimensions, so six measurements of neurons simultaneously, and then this right here will be my, um, my diagram of all the possible states. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a whole chunk of neural data and then I'm just counting how many times are all of these six neurons active? How many times are five of them active? How many times is only one of them active or none of them active? And so you come up with 64 of these states and I can count the frequency. Yes, that's a question. Can you clarify, you just talked about channels and then switched over to units. Can you speak towards whether you're more concerned with unit activity or with channels? Because they're not the same. So the question is that, that, again, I made a sleight of hand and I, I talked between recording channels and then I uh, talked about single neurons. I believe that if you do fMRI or EG, this is also gonna work. All you need to do is find six parts of the system that you're interested in, six EG electrodes, six voxels, six areas, whatever you're interested in, and then you have to binarize the data. So you have to come up with an with a on or off and you can do this any way you like. You can say it should be uh, uh, above the average activity, below the average activity. In fact, you could also, instead of binarizing the data, come up with four different states. It would just cause more states to be in your matrix. But there's no limit to, to this theory, which is what I'm excited about. Other questions? Does all of this make sense? Okay. So the first thing that I think you should always do is uh, test these kind of assumptions with noise before you throw brain data on it and get excited about it. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is that I simulated six brain channels and all they do is white noise. So it's not really anything, it's just random data so there shouldn't be any structure in this transition probability matrix. And that's exactly what I found. So you notice these are six states in, in the present and then these are six states in the future and the probabilities between them are very low because it's random and there's no structure in that matrix. Now the first surprise when I started to use this approach to neural data is when I did the next step, which is that of course we never get brain data this way, we get brain data that looks this way. So uh, technically speaking, we're talking about one over F noise or pink noise or brown noise, there's a history in the noise that we have, it's not just simple random data. Well if you do that, all of a sudden you get uh, an extreme amount of structure, yes? What is your binarization type? In this case, um, I'm taking multi-unit uh, activity, well, this is, sorry, uh, this is not even neural data yet. All I'm doing is I'm taking a chunk of time, taking the mean of a time, and then I'm looking at what's below or above the mean. So that's... Um, power of LFP broadband. Uh, so in this case, it's actually even simpler. I just take a time series like this, yeah. I compute the mean, yeah. each time it's above the mean, I give it a one, each time I give it a, below, I give it a zero. Yes? Can you just kick back one slide? Sure. I can almost pretend that there is Diagonal line yeah, there might be a little bit of structure, um, and yeah. that's what I was getting to. It's pronounced here, isn't it? It is much more pronounced. <laughs> so, 
still think that there's structure, even in what we think is completely yes. unstructured. Yes. So there's what is the cross correlation between the noise itself? Yeah, so there's structure, and it's, it's, uh, the noise is completely uncorrelated, but you still see structure. And the first time I saw it, I was troubled, and I thought there might be wrong, something wrong with the theory. Um, but then it struck me, um, taking a shower as always, that the probability for a system where all six channels are below zero to go into a state where all six channels are above zero should be lower than the probability that the, one of them goes into uh, an up state. And so if you, if you look into that a little bit, computer scientists have thought about this for a very long time, and it's a, it's a unit that is very well known. It's called the Hamming distance. So it's often used to, in machine learning, for example, to compare words. So the word Carolyn and Catherine is closer than um, the word um, Catherine and Kirsten, because there's the, there's the, the amount of of letters that you have to change goes up in each of these cases. So it, with a binary system, you can, uh, with a simple binary system with three nodes, you can see the Hamming distance right there. So you can order it in a three-dimensional space. And you can see that the Hamming distance from 0, 0, 0 to 0, 0, 003 is, of course, a smaller distance than from 0, 0, 0 to 111. And uh, of course, if you go up one way, um, in this case, you have four nodes. Now you get a hypercube in four-dimensional space, and you can compute all of these Hamming distances. I have a six-dimensional piece of data right here, so I can't visualize it, but I can compute it. It's one line in MATLAB. I did compute it, and this is what it comes out as. So this is the Hamming distance between all of these 64 states. And you probably see that that looks very similar. So in fact, of course, since that is the distance, the likelihood of transitioning between these states should be one minus that. And that's exactly what I find here. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we have a baseline. It means that if you have completely random data, uncorrelated neural data, you actually didn't really measure the brain, you should see this. It also should give you an idea of how noisy your data is. Because if you only acquired a small amount of data and you don't have enough to estimate all of the state transitions, then it doesn't look quite like that. It looks more noisy than that. So you can estimate uh, uh, effects and you can estimate a noise level just looking at this transition probability matrix. So that's the next thing I did. So I correlated artificially the data again and you can see that even with very tiny amounts of correlation between the data, the structure changes completely and now we can do something as simple as just subtracting these uh, from each other or you throw them in a multi-dimensional space and compute, you name it, the Mahalanobis distance, the Euclidean distance, any kind of norm, any kind of distance that um, we have uh, available with machine learning and simple techniques between them. What I find interesting though is this case. So in this case, three channels are correlated with each other. And that is something that with the old techniques would take that, um, that extra path of finding each of these correlations, each of these pairwise combinations to find this out. But here, at one point, you immediately see that these three are connected. Now, to simplify that, I think, uh, and I'm not the first person to think about that, uh, we should take a matrix like that and exploit the fact that we have mathematics available that takes complicated matrices, just like the one that I showed you, and put that into what we call a graph. So specifically, if I have three different measurements of brain activity, each of these can become what is a node. Remember, we're not actually looking at the causal or the information flow between these three electrodes or three measurements. What we're doing is we're looking at the connection between the activity state between each of them. So with uh, three electrodes, we, of course, get up um, a higher number. So this would be all three electrodes having uh, a below average activity, all three electrodes having an above average activity. And then you can see with these arrows, um, you can see the direction, uh, uh, present to future, and then the thickness of these arrows shows you the likelihood, the probability with which these trans transitions. Yes? You can put the white noise, but the way you've described this as across channels, uh, uh, noise it seems like it would be the exact extreme opposite of this, and it would affect all the channels. In fact, in the face of that, we'll, we'll go across the Hamming distance, then everything will go from everything, we'll go from nothing, so we'll go from the off to the on state. Volume conduction, for example, they're not independent samples. Yeah, so I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, if I understand the question correctly, I, I would argue this is exactly what allows you to do that. So you've, you can find out what the transition probability is from something, uh, uh, for example, all channels in a down state or all channels in an up state, and then you can compare the two, the Hamming distance. In fact, if I throw the Hamming distance in that same graph, you can immediately tell the big difference. Yes, but it seems like you're using that as the experimental hypothesis that you're going away from the null. Are you significantly different than Hamming? So mm -hmm. basically... Jump, being able to jump from nothing to everything would be sort of the most extreme of the, the mm -hmm. IAP. I'm saying, but noise actually would manifest that way depending on how you set up the experiment. So if you've had it off to on across multiple channels detecting electrical signals, oh, I see what you're saying. Right? Then an artifact noise that turns everything from off to on, because it's going across every, right? That, that would read as your, your highest level of consciousness, if, if, unless I've misunderstood. No, we're not at the consciousness part yet, <laughs> but, but yet. It would be the most extreme example yeah. of what it seems like you were saying would be the Yes. So what I'm actually getting at is I would less argue that we should try to find significant differences between the Hamming distance and our actual data. I think that um, we could do this with the Mahalanobis distance or other multidimensional ways of taking that into account. But what I would do is I would compare different states. So let's say the, uh, the animal attends or doesn't attend. 
So in that case, um, th that, should, that should take away some of that concern, that you're actually looking at differences within the system. So if you have an artifact, it should show up in both conditions. And last, so, so, or as you go along, maybe uh, commenting, uh, making comments towards exactly that, but you know, if the difference in your condition had a different likelihood of getting that artifact, could that be misinterpreted as? Uh, yeah, so if you have an artifact that systematically goes with your condition, any uh, analytic approach would make that an effect, I think. Uh, except that you sometimes have things where you see region specificity or you have sort of control areas or control situations that, that allow you to differentiate. So maybe let's take that offline because I can see sure. different controls here as well. But I think if, you, if you're conflating an artifact with the effect you're looking for, it's, it's correlative. Whatever you do, it will probably show up as an artifact. There's ways of looking at outliers, and I think there's ways of looking at outliers here as well. So basically, as you go along, is that, that one thing I'm keeping an eye towards or would be interested in is you know, if it allows you to set up specific predictions that can't simply be fulfilled by uh, an artifact. Yeah, this, maybe as I said, maybe we should take that offline. I, I think that's the case, but um, okay. So one thing I want to emphasize, um, what I just said, is that this is actually just the first step of this graph that I, of the, the figure that I showed you from Natsuki that has 20 steps in it. So the, um, already, I think this is interesting, and we're still far removed from computing phi or doing this consciousness-related computation. This is just a new way to look at the data, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that we already have discussions about that because it's a, it is a new way to look at it um, uh, and, and has benefits of other techniques. So one of the ideas that I had, for example, is see these loops. That is the probability that you're going back to the same state that you were already in. And remember that I said you're computing one state at present and then a second state in the future. So an easy, interesting uh, uh, test might be to vary the time delay between them and look at the thickness of these loops. So you might be able to find that these loops get very thin and then thick again. So that might be, for example, one interpretation that there's feedback happening in your system. So this is, as I said, this is uh, just the very first step of this analysis. And uh, I approached some uh, of the people in the, uh, in the audience uh, with my excitement before. And they made me aware that, of course, uh, other people have thought about this as well. This is a neuron paper that just appeared, I think, a month or two ago from our colleague uh, Alex Thiele um, and um, Terry Moore, Tiana Engler on there, and Nick Steinmetz. And they're computing a transition probability matrix for their data. Uh, in this case, trying to show that feedback is uh, top-down controlled. So all I'm doing here is uh, basically saying that, yes, this is an interesting technique. I hope I gave you a flavor of why this might be interesting. But then I want to move on. So there's more. To, uh, to this kind of computing phi and, and using integrated information theory. And I want to uh, actually get to my own data and show you that. So these are multi-unit spiking and local feed potentials, and it's um, trial average data. You can see there's a stimulus coming on right here and there. And what my lab is doing is we're recording these kinds of responses across the whole column of cortex. Well, the first problem that you can see with what I told you is that um, the states, they change because of an external manipulation. So in this case, all the states, they go up in value because I'm turning on a stimulus. So my first impulse was to try to get rid of that and to basically uh, try to achieve um, a more constant state. So what I'm doing is I'm computing the average response of each of these neural measurements, and then I'm subtracting it trial by trial, so that I'm only ending up with residuals. And you can see this right here. This is time. These are trials. And you can see that there is this peak uh, across each of these trials of the stimulus repetitions. And then I subtract um, the average of that from all of the data, and I end up with something that's much more flat. And then what I do is uh, what I just said before. I take the average of activity level in each trial, and when the data is above, I paint it black, I call it an upstate. When it is below the average, I call it a downstate, and you see it here in white. So each of these lines is one trial, and then what you see in these blocks are measurements across the depth of cortex. This is what multi-unit spiking looks like. This is what local field potentials look like. And you can already see that there's a big difference, and that probably makes sense to you, that local field potentials are slower varying, and you can see that these states trans transition much more slowly. And without going into all of the details, uh, if you have a two-dimensional measurements of voltages, you can convert that back, if you know the ohmic resistance between them, into currents. And that is something that we do a lot because it actually approximates the synaptic inputs to these neurons. And uh, in doing so, you're increasing the noise level a lot, and you can immediately see that there are some channels where now we're just looking at noise. So uh, I, I was taking, again, six of these channels. You can see these uh, 64 resultant states here again. And now I'm not looking at the transition probability. All that I'm doing is I'm counting the occurrence of each of these states for each of these trials. Um, uh, sorry, as a function of time uh, across the trials, and the stimulus comes on around here. And you can see that there are some states, in this case, the state that all of them are uh, down states, that are predominant the data. So this is a histogram that just collapses over time. And so uh, a logical next step, of course, is to look at how does this change when you turn the stimulus on. So all I'm doing now is I'm comparing before the stimulus comes on and after the stimulus comes on, and there's already something that's interesting peaking out again, which is that the distribution of these states, again, I'm not even computing the transition probabilities at this point. I'm just looking at how often does each of these states occur. It changes dramatically in a way that you see that each of these states is now, once the stimulus comes on, much more often represented. In other ways, the uh, probability that the system is in one state or the other becomes more widely distributed. So a, a fancy term for that would be that the entropy increases. 
And we can visualize that, of course. Uh, so in this case here, again, this is what most of us are familiar for. This is a time series of data with the animal fixating, and then a stimulus comes on. In this case, in blue, the animal is paying attention. In red, the animal is not paying attention. And in this case, I'm just taking three neural measurements, one in the upper layers of cortex, one in the middle layers, and one in the lower layers of cortex. So I'm getting less of these potential states. And again, I'm just looking at, across trials, what is the frequency with which each of these states occur? Again, you can see that the most common state is that all of them are in a down state, but you see this rapid shift in the distribution of states once the stimulus comes on. So I'm not going any further in, in this part. I just want to show you that even before you get to the transition probability, um, just looking at the state distributions may be an interesting way for you to do with your data. And by no means will you be limited to just three measurements. OK. So let's go to the, uh, to the part that uh, I see first people leaving already, because now we will start talking about consciousness. But I'm actually really excited about it, because I told you that what integrated information theory does is it does try to approximate something that we understand with consciousness, but at the same time, it gives you an idea of the system. It's measuring how many causal connections are in the system, because when you severe these connections and you lose any effect, you know that those are not causal. So I will very briefly, and this will, might be frustrating, walk, through, walk you through the rest of the algorithms or the math that's involved in it, just to give you a flavor. I appreciate that um, it, this is going to be too little time to do this, but I just want to give you an idea that there are well-defined steps and to give you an intuition for how you get there. OK, so this should be familiar to you. This I'm taking now from now to Kia's paper. So you have two channels, two neurons, whatever uh, you want to measure in the brain, and you assume that they are interconnected. So you're taking the, the, the varying activity as a function of time, and you binarize it. In this case, again, you just take the mean, you look at what's above and below the mean, and then you compute the transition probability, what I said before. So you take the, the state uh, at present, as both of them are off, what is the likelihood that we end up with one of them, A, being activated at the next step in time. And you find, in this case, it's 0.43%. So you create this transition probability matrix that we talked about. Now, what you do in integrated information theory is you start with taking one of these states. And then for, each, for one of these states, you take what we call a mechanism. So in this case, this would be A. So A is a potential mechanism. So it might be a neuron or might be a measurement in the brain area, if you will. And it could affect the rest of your brain or the rest of your measurements. So it's a mechanism. So it's a lot of jargon, and that's why I tried to use a little, little bit of uh, color. And what you're trying to find out is what is the causal effect of this mechanism onto the rest of your system. So is there a causal effect of A onto the rest of your system? And the way to find out is that you're exploiting the transition probability matrix. So now what you can do is you can tinker with A and you can look at the transition probability of A onto later effects. And so that allows you to compute the integrated information, which is the combined effect of A onto the system. How do you do it? Well, this is a quick detour, a quick aside. So in statistics, there's been a, a revolution that some of us might have heard about, others, you might find this interesting, which is that when you have data and you have a connected system where there's causal influences and you know the causal connections, you know the network that you're studying, which a lot of us do when it comes to the brain, you can compute the causal effect within that system without having to do a manipulation. Because what you can do is you can manipulate the system in hindsight in the computer in terms of statistics. So what do you do? So this is a very common statistical example of one variable affecting another variable and then a confounding variable that affects both. And so you want to find out what is the cause effect of each of these. Well, if you know the connections and you know these transition probabilities, so you know the, um, the, the, um, how the system goes from one state to the other state, what you can do is an intervention. And so that is what's called do calculus was invented by Julia Pearl. All you do is you set one of these variables constant, or you basically uh, 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 null it. You take it out of your matrix, and you see, is there an effect? And if there's an effect, you know that this causally contributed. Now, you might feel that if I would take anything out of my data, it's going to have an effect. And so what this whole talk was uh, slowly running out of time will lead up to is that surprisingly, at least when I look for my own data, most of the things that you think that have a causal effect actually don't. So how do you do this in practice? Well, so here's, here's an example taken from the, pap from the paper that is, again, uh, trying to keep things very simple, where you have uh, two mechanisms, and both of them are down, one is up, and so on. And then all you do is, is you're denoising, um, is the technical term for that. Uh, I like better the term marginalizing the effect of one of these mechanisms. So as you can see right here, you can just take one of them out, let's say A, and then you can see what would happen if I take one of them out. And it comes out as simple as just computing the average across here and across there. And so basically, this right here is your new transition probability if A wouldn't exist. Now, if A had a causal effect, this should look very different than what you started out with. But if A doesn't matter, and you do this operation, then you should find the exact same probability distribution, and you know that A had no causal effect. And so this is what integrated information theory does. So basically, what we're doing is we're denoising the input of one of these mechanisms, in this case A, onto, in this case, A itself. So there's no more feedback. 
or we're taking it out the effect on A to B or the effect on A and B at the same time. Yes. Okay, so we don't do a lot of things, but if I'm following you, the logical or would be at least a subset of something that it might not do. Namely, if A has a piece and B has a piece and it's a shared piece, you could take either of them out, it would be fine. You'd conclude that you know neither A nor B are critical, but in fact, it was that piece shared between the two that was the thing. So redundancy across A and B, the logical or, it wouldn't be sensitive to, is that correct? So what I'm showing, there's a great question. What I'm showing you right here is only one mechanism. Okay. So this will be an iterative process where you have to do it for each mechanism and they combine the combination as well. There you go, great. And so here you see the probabilities that we computed and you can see that there's one probability right here that pretty much looks like the original probability and that gives you an, an idea of the causal effect. Okay, so um, yeah, let me move on uh, to uh, what kind of came uh, with this question. So. Of course, uh, now we have to do this for all of these different combinations. So I said, this is basically just for one of these effects. Uh, we can look at the causal effect and then we have to iterate it and then iterate it and we have to do it again and again and again and we have done all the possible combinations. And then we can end up with something like um, looking at this whole system and find out what are the different uh, causal uh, effect relationships that actually matter, that are actually irreducible. I know I'm going fast here, but the good news is that all of this uh, is done behind your back in an algorithm. So as long as you got a transition probability matrix, you can feed it into integrated information theory and it does all of this work for you. Okay, so. So at the very end of iterating and iterating and iterating, what you can come up with is an ultimate scalar and that scalar, as I said, is called phi. And phi, by the definition of integrated information theory, corresponds to your level of consciousness. So we're pretty far into this talk, and I assume that most of you have probably gotten a little bit drowsy, so your phi sunk. But your phi would be computed over your entire brain. But I am advocating is that we can use this math, we can use this algorithm, even if we don't have all of these complete data. And there's already interesting things to learn. And that is what um, was shown in this paper with the fruit fly, where this phi value, indeed, across repetitions, repeatedly sunk with um, anesthesia. Now, as I said, Everything that I walked you through so far was just for one particular state. So this would have to repeat it for all of the different states that you have. So a piece of warning right here is that even with very simple data, if you run this algorithm, uh, there's a long wait time involved to get a, a final computational output. Now I just want to give you an idea why I'm interested about this. So let's go back to the data that I showed you. This right here is, as I said, neural data. It's uh, lambda data from area V4. None of that is, I think, very important. What I'm showing you right here are the transition probability matrices of recordings in the upper, middle, lower layers of cortex um, as the task goes on. And you're familiar with this representation. And then what I'm doing right here is I'm just computing a 2D correlation coefficient for the matrices that, that you see here in graph form between these two states, shown in blue and in red. So importantly, there's no difference here in terms of any of the stimulation for the animal. And I'm running all of this math and I'm computing this phi value. And you can see that if I run this phi value within the baseline where the animal is maybe in a semi-drowsy state, as many of us might be right now, uh, the phi value is not that high. And then I measure again uh, a little bit later and you can see obviously there's some noise, it will fluctuate, but it's still not that high. One second, please. And then if I show a stimulus, you can see how phi also shoots up. Now, this is interesting because the way that I derived this phi value was with deriving these causal connections that we ta just talked about. So it is not trivial that the phi value goes up. It shows the system becomes more interconnected, if you will. And I got really excited when I computed phi for blue versus red here, where you see a tiny difference in firing rate that we typically get quite excited about in neurophysiology because it correlates with attention state. But look at this huge difference in phi that actually correlates with these two types of data with phi dropping below the baseline value when the animal doesn't attend, which of course makes sense because in this case, attention is focused on one part of the visual field where here it might be widely distributed. Another question, yeah. So this is the input that I showed you before where I'm taking the spiking and I'm looking at is it above or below the average for each trial in the middle upper and lower layers of cortex. And then I'm running all of these causal uh, calculations that I just showed you. But is it from 10.1 to 10.2? Great question. I was hoping that nobody would ask me this question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what I'm doing, so it's an instantaneous measure. That's why I'm showing it to you to here and again and again and again. And so, uh, as I said, you can play around with that. You can take time this away and you can compute a phi value within each trial, or you can take a single point in time and if you have enough trials, you can compute, compute phi over the trials and that's what I decided to do. And so this ongoing work, which one might be better? And, and so um, now and I explore these kinds of questions. Um, there's also the question of like, what do you call 
present and what do you call future? How much is the delay? And what I'm doing right here is I'm taking above one, uh, an average of about one synapse. So it's between eight or uh, 10 milliseconds of delay. But you can play with that as well. So it's, it's a very rich playground to look at your data. That's what I'm getting at. Yes. In this case, exactly. In this case, it's at this point in time for many, many repetitions of the task. Okay, so we're almost uh, ready. I know I'm on the time, so I'm going to go very fast. Everything I told you about so far is about level. It's about how conscious you are. What I'm most interested in and most excited about, and I invite you to come to the second talk that I'm going to give in the CCN seminar, where I will expand on that, is what I told you that you can use the same math to get to find out what the perception is. And that might be even uh, 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 more out there for you to, um, uh, to, uh, to take for granted. But what I'm getting at is you can do what I just said, the same kind of causal partition between all of the different cause effects that are possible in the system. And uh, it's pretty much the same algorithm, but except for one mechanism, you take a whole cause effect in the whole cause effect structure. And so this is pretty much my last slide. This right here is the input that I started out with today with the transition probabilities. These right here are the only cause effects that in the end survived that analysis when I did it. So A, B, and C are the different layers of cortex. And you can see that only one of these layers of cortex ended up having any causal effect. All of the other uh, layers of cortex I was able to eliminate because they did make no difference when I took them out uh, using this causal analysis. And uh, the whole purpose of this talk was to find potential collaborations or others being interested in that. So I want to quickly announce that I went through the trouble of putting all of this code, which is most easily uh, accessible via Python, into a Google Colab, which is a Jupyter notebook that is publicly available. So um, I'd be happy to give you the link. And then all you have to do is take your transition probability matrix that would still be on you, computed in MATLAB, you put it into this website, and it computes phi and that structure that I showed in the end for you. And with that, I know I'm over time, so I thank you very much for letting me decrease your phi over time. Thank you.